Are there any questions? How are you guys doing on the current assignment? Awful. Awful? Horrible. Horrible. <laughs> the challenge is too high. OK. Um, Should we then divert from the lecture and go through the assignment? Do you need some help? It may actually be a very good strategy because you guys have looked at it and struggling with it. Maybe if I say something about it, you'll pay attention and it'll stick more. Uh, this Saturday, I believe, is the makeup class, right? So we will maybe do this today's lecture at that time. <coughs> okay. Um, let me just open up a blank document so that I can scribble things. <coughs> I will then make the assignment due by tomorrow, 4 o'clock. Okay, but I will have the next assignment handed out because that's going to be the practice for your midterm which is next Tuesday right so the next assignment should be up by end of today and this Saturday maybe we can discuss that but uh, I, I'm trying to shift the mode of working from understanding one-liners in MATLAB which is what we did in the first three assignments on the first midterm to problem solving okay now the current problem solving are mostly based on geometry and algebra and maybe one problem from 2171. But as we go, it will be more drawn from chemical engineering examples. And you will see those examples only in subsequent courses. Okay. So I'm going to just open up this assignment and <coughs> sketch out the solution procedure. I'm not going to, of course, give you the solution, but I think many people who who have come to my office um, have this problem of how do I get started? Okay, um, here is a problem, and what do I do? Okay, so I'm going to address that issue of given a problem, how do we develop a method for developing a solution? First, understanding it, and then uh, having in your mind an outline of what you need to do and coding and scripting, I will leave it up to you. So I'm going to try to bridge that gap, reading the problem, trying to understand what it is, and then using the MATLAB tools to write the scripts and functions to sol solve this particular problem. Uh, so let's take the first problem. Uh, it is from trigonometry <coughs> in high school, okay? But what is the problem about? <coughs> Quadratic algebraic equations. How do we solve algebraic equations using a quadratic equation, which most of you know, but we are doing it in such a way that we can generalize this to cubic or quadratic equations as well as any general nonlinear function. Now, most of the chemical process plants uh, will use simulators called HISIS or ASPEN. These are all called steady state simulators and they do mass energy balances, what you're learning in 2171 but they have coded everything into a program, okay? So your job would be to construct the flow sheet, identify the inputs, and it will calculate the outputs for you. So the refinery is getting a certain crude from Texas with a certain composition. You need to tell what kind of operating conditions you have so that it can predict how much of gasoline you are going to get, how much of diesel fuel or heating oil, etc. That might change from summer to uh, winter, etc. right? But these solvers essentially assemble a set of nonlinear algebraic equations and solve them. And that's what we have been talking about in the last uh, two assignments. How do we set up problems where we have nonlinear algebraic equations and solve using MATLAB as a tool? So in this particular example, you are told, I guess I should open it with uh, the thing where I can write. <coughs> Okay, you're told that there are two triangles forming a quadrilateral and it's arbitrary shape, arbitrary length. It's not a right triangle, it's not an isosceles triangle. 
So it's a uh, strange looking beast, but you know from uh, uh, trigonometry that if you are given the two sides and the angle, you can calculate what the opposite side length is given by this formula. Okay, so here we are saying that B1 is given, C1 is given, and A1, the angle is given. So how do you calculate A? Now this is a generalization of a Pythagoras theorem. What is Pythagoras theorem? When A1 is 90 degrees, you know that the hypotenuse square equals sum of the other two squares, B1 square plus C1 square. And of course, when the, the A1 is 90, cos 90 is zero. So this formula indeed reduces to Pythagoras theorem. Okay, and <coughs> what you are asked to do is first by using the roots function in MATLAB, solve the quadratic equation. Roots function actually solves any <coughs> polynomial. Okay, and we will open up MATLAB and see. Um, so you are supposed to write a script file that will develop the solution to this particular problem. Okay, and run the script file to uh, find the answer. Now the answer actually that you are seeking for is this. This is the length that I don't know. I also know B2, I also know A2, okay? So the first thing I need to know is that I can calculate, this is, we're talking about the process of identifying what the problem says and what I need to calculate. So make a checklist of all the things that are given and identify what you need to solve for and see whether you can assemble an equation that will allow you to solve for the thing that you are wanting to solve. Okay, so in this case, you, are, uh, you, you need to solve for C2, and <coughs> one equation is given, you can write the other equation too. So if I go back and write these equations, the first one is, uh, oops, what is happening here? Okay, B1 square plus C1 square minus 2B1 C1 cos A1 is equal to A squared from the upper triangle, okay? I, I'll just switch between these two. So from the upper triangle, B1 square plus C1 square minus two B1 C1 cos A1 is equal to A square, okay? But from the bottom triangle, that should be the same as B2 square plus C2 square minus two B2 C2 cos A2, okay? So these two distances refer to the same length A, so that equation is valid. Okay, and whether I calculate A from the upper triangle or lower triangle, they must be the same. Okay? So we have the equation there and check what are the things that are known. B1 is given, C1 is given, okay, and A1 is given. And similarly, B2 is given and A2 is given, but C2 is the unknown. And it appears in two places. So that characterizes it as a nonlinear equation. So it is a nonlinear algebraic equation coming from some geometry and trigonometry problem. Okay? So your job is to find that value of C2 that satisfies that equation. The first thing to recognize is that you can write this as a quadratic equation in the unknown C2. Okay? That means you can write it as a factor multiplied by C2 squared, another factor multiplied by C2, and then the third factor equal to zero. So your job is to rearrange it in such a way that it looks like a quadratic equation. Okay? And once you have done that, you can use the roots function in MATLAB to solve for it. Okay? So in this particular case, C2, for example, has a coefficient of 1. I'm going to move everything to the left-hand side. So when it comes to the left-hand side, it's going to be minus 1. Okay? And the coefficient of C2 has minus 2B2 cos A2. When that goes to the left-hand side, it becomes plus. 2 B2 cos A2. Now I can plug the numbers for these so I can calculate it as a number. Okay? <coughs> that much you should be able to do. So at this stage once I lay it out and I will kind of hint at how you will write the script and you need, you need to be able to complete it. Okay? Then whatever is left from that equation, so if I start cancelling it, I have taken care of this term, I have taken care of this term. So there are a lot of other terms that I need to Include. So one of them would be B1 square plus C1 square. So these are taken care of. Minus 2 B1 C1 cos A1 minus B2 square. Okay, so that takes care of that. So all the terms are taken care of. The same equation simply rearranged in such a way that 
I have a quadratic equation. And the quadratic equation has these as coefficients. <coughs> And those coefficients are numbers I can calculate because all the variables are given. B2 is a number, A2 is a number, you can plug it in. Okay? So to solve for the first part, all you need to do is recognize that there is a function called roots in MATLAB. Maybe we'll go to the MATLAB at this stage. Any questions on that problem? Absolute silence means you're okay. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Did you have a question? You seem to be quite frustrated, shaking your head. <laughs> it doesn't help? No. <coughs> Let's trace back. Where, which, which part of it didn't make sense? I don't see how you got the coefficient. <coughs> but you understand this equation. You understand that A must be the same from the top and the bottom. And that gives us the top equation that I've written, right? So you, you are worried about how I went from this step to this step. That's simple rearrangement. Okay. So what, all I'm saying is I'm going to take this term to the left-hand side. So it becomes minus C2 squared. So minus 1 times C2 squared. So minus 1 is just the sign that multiplies C2 squared term. And then I take this entire term to the left-hand side. That becomes plus 2B2. Okay. Uh, <coughs> this entire term, what, what is it? <coughs> this entire term is the same as this. But it becomes, when it goes to the left hand side, when I take that term to the left hand side, it becomes plus 2b2 cos a2. I separate out the c2. What about b2 squared? This term is whatever is left. So let me pick a different color maybe and highlight that. Uh, I guess. So B2, that's B2. C1, that's C1. Minus 2B1, that's that term. Okay? And then B2 square is here, but it goes to the left hand side. So it becomes minus B2 square because I'm taking every term to the left hand side and flipping the sign. So this B2 square, it was originally on the right side here. No? <coughs> now I need to strike a balance because I, I want to make sure that everybody understands it, but silence doesn't give me a good feedback. Yeah? I'm just worried, about, like, my issue is like doing MATLAB stuff, not the algorithm. How many of you are in that stage that you can understand the problem but you cannot implement it in MATLAB? So I wasted 10 minutes. <laughs> you should have told me that before. I could then go into, I'm not going to give you the solution because you need to struggle with that. But I will give you a helping hand so that you can complete it. Okay? So now we have this equation. Let's learn something about roots. And that's something I wanted you to go through by yourself. So go to MATLAB and say, well, this guy asked me to use roots. What is roots? Well, roots. Okay. Because I never talked about roots before, but the reason is I wanted you to develop the ability to kind of learn on your own. That's an important goal because MATLAB is too huge. I cannot teach you every aspect of it. But it says find polynomial roots. So it's a very general program that finds the roots of any polynomial. Now it says that its input is C. So it computes the roots of the polynomial whose coefficients are the elements of the vector c. So what it says is you need to construct a vector c <coughs> containing the coefficients of a polynomial. Okay? And it needs only numbers, those coefficients of the polynomials. And they must be ordered in such a way that the highest power is numbered as c1. That is, in the root, you're going to, in the first place is going to contain a coefficient that multiplies the highest power. Okay? And the second one will contain the root that multiplies the next lowest power, etc. It must, must be ordered in such a way. So let's just, do you understand how root works with, by reading this? How many of you have difficulty in trying to decipher what MATLAB is trying to tell you in the help? 
So that, that will have to come by practice. You read it, if you don't understand it, always come to me and I will show you how, how to interpret it, how to read it, okay? But you must have in your mind already what polynomials are, how many roots are to a polynomial and what do we mean by these roots. So the, the roots function finds the roots of any polynomial. So if I create a vector like c equals 2, 5, 10 and then call roots c, what it is going to do is it's going to take, maybe I will ask you, what quadratic is it going to solve? 2, 2x squared plus 5x plus 10 equal to 0. That's a quadratic that it's going to solve, okay? So it will give me two roots and those are the two roots. The roots can be complex, depends on the magnitude of the coefficients, right? So if I do this, what is the degree of the polynomial I'm going to solve? Yeah? Three, three cubic. So if I pass that to roots, I'll get three roots. One of them is real, two are complex pairs, okay? So that is the purpose of roots and it can solve any degree polynomial. So if your nonlinear problem is in the form of a polynomial nonlinearity, roots is the best way to go because it gives you all the roots. Okay? Any questions on roots? Now, yeah? Uh, is it whenever you write, whenever you do it in the script, how do you tell me uh, give the positive value? Or does it give both negative? It will give all the roots, negative and complex and everything. Right. Okay, uh, that's a good question and if you want to do that, it's great because you are taking the problem to the next level. I, I asked for all the roots, but if you want to select only the positive root and print it, that I will show you how to do that. Okay, there was a question there. Exactly. You can just use that condition. If the root is greater than zero, print that. Otherwise, don't print that, right? So you can use that. That's the kind of thinking I want every one of you to develop, okay? Pose a question and say, well, how do I do it, okay? And we have learned if for so many commands, so many statements, now the challenge is how do we use all these together to address specific needs like that, okay? I might ask you in an exam, select and print only the positive roots, then you should be able to come up with a solution for that. Or I might say that this one is supposed to print only the positive root, does it work? Okay. Then you have to interpret what the code that I've given is and check and know whether it works. So there are two levels of programming. One is deciphering and understanding somebody else's program, not just a one-liner, but a series of program the statements. And then the next higher level ability is for you to write those statements yourself to solve a particular problem. Okay, yeah. When is your exam? Next Tuesday. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, going back to this problem, so how do I <coughs> write a script? I have figured this out. Most of you are comfortable with figuring this out. So, how do I program it in MATLAB as a script? So, you might have a statement like, you can do it in one line or you can do it in several lines. Uh, let me show you the several line version of it, okay? So, uh, you can have a statement C1 equals minus 1, okay? But before that, you may want to have statements like B2 equals, I need to put all these numbers. B2, for example, was uh, 165, okay? I'm not going to fill every one of them. But you fill all the numbers that where I have put a tick mark, there is a value for them. So in this line, you fill all those numbers. Those numbers are defined, they have values. Then you can use those symbols to do the calculation like this. C2 equals two times B2 times cos B A2. So what does that do? It simply calculates this particular coefficient. 2 times B2, B2 must be defined before. 
Cos D is a function that take calculates the cosine, but in degrees. So A2 can be in degrees. If you put just cos, it puts it in, it expects the input to be in radians. And that's some common mistake that people make, okay? So, and what would I have the next? Let me see whether you can project, build on that. C, three equals the last statement, which is B1 squared plus C1 squared minus etc. 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 Is this level of introduction enough? If I go one more step, I'll give you the solution. <laughs> yeah? Uh, I had named it different than C1, C2, C3. Is that that right? doesn't matter. You can. I love C1 is just one. That's fine too. You can flip the sign of all the coefficients. Yeah, plug it, it in right. So that, that, that's all consistent. You can do that in a consistent way. You can flip the sign of all the terms in the polynomial. It doesn't change the rules. And <coughs> you can, for example, this is one way of doing it. And then you will call roots C. And it will print out both the roots. Okay. And now you can save this result into an answer. Okay. So you may call it as what do you want to call it? Um, we are calculating C2, right? So we can call it C2. So C2 will be a vector containing two numbers. Now let's address the question that he raised. I wanted to print out. Now what would be the length of C2? That would depend on the number of entries in C. In this case, I have three entries. So it is a second degree polynomial. So C2 will have two roots. Okay? And you can then say <coughs> if <coughs> C2 is, uh, what do you do? You, you, you can do a for loop because you know that there are two values. You can check each one of those roots. Or you can use the matrix element itself. And that would be if C2 is, no, I think you should use the find command. It is at this stage, I would rather prefer not to write it down, but go to MATLAB and figure it out, and then put it into the script file. because my. I, I cannot write on a piece of paper. I want to test it, right? So <coughs> let me just go to MATLAB. So uh, I had this. Uh, let me change, change the numbers to maybe one. So there are two roots, OK? So I want to print the root that is between minus 3 and minus 2, for example, OK? So in this case, I just picked some numbers. The two roots happen to be minus 2.2 and minus 0.2. And I want the root that lies farther to the left. Okay. So there are many ways of doing it. You can use the sort function, for example. Sort the answer. And it sorts it in the order of uh, the smallest to the largest. Okay. Minus 2.2 being the smallest on the leftmost side. Okay. And the sort function itself can return the index. For example, you can, I, I guess I should do it again. Let me st store it in C2. Now, if I'm doing any of those that is not making sense, you just ask me, why did you do that? Okay, I'm assuming that as I'm demonstrating it, you guys are observing and understanding what I'm doing. So I've calculated the two roots using some coefficients, and I'm telling, addressing the point, how do I select one of those roots? I want the smallest root, for example. Okay? In this case, the smallest root is minus 2.28. So I could pass this to C2. And the answer is in C2, right? <coughs> the answer I sh uh, store in sort C2, for example. So I've sorted roots in C2. And then all I have to do is sort C2, 1. So th that one contains the lowest value. The sort function sorts it that way. Okay? So I can print that. Okay? Now, if I had two numbers, let me just make some numbers. Okay? C2 equals uh, 171.15 and minus 220. Suppose I had these two as the roots, and I want to print only the positive root. Okay? The positive root. Then I could check. Okay, um, find, let's just do C2 greater than zero. What do you think it will produce? 
C2 greater than 0. I am checking. Is C2 greater than 0? C2 has these two numbers, 171.15 and minus 200. I should get 1, 1, 0. Does everybody understand that? So here I am checking whether each one of those numbers is greater than 0. So this number is greater than 0, it will return 1. This number is less than 0, it will return 0. Okay? 1, 0. Okay? <coughs> now, uh, there is a find C, uh, C2 greater than 0. C2. <coughs> so that returns a value of 1. That is in the f uh, first position. Okay? C2 is still this. But in the first position, that condition was true. Okay? That it was greater than 0. So you can select like that. Okay? Or there are many ways of doing it. You can simply use the for loop for i equals 1 to 2. Okay? If C2 of i greater than 0, then f print f the root positive root is okay percent g backslash n comma uh, what did I have c to i how many of you understand what what I have typed type there so this is another way of doing it so what I am showing here is there are two roots in variable C2, and I'm doing checking one by one. So for i equals 1 to 2, tw go twice. And if C2i, the first time i will be 1, is positive, then print it. If not, don't print it. Okay? And you end that. Uh, continue entering statement. I finished it. <laughs> For and if, thank you very much. Right. There, the positive root is 171.15. Does that answer your question? Okay. There are many ways of accomplishing in MATLAB what you want to do. Okay. So the most important thing as an engineer is figuring out what it is that you want to do. And that's what these problems expose you to. Okay. So getting back to the problem, the first part is essentially done. Okay, you, you use the roots function to find the two roots, and if you want to print only one of the root, pass the root, you can do that. The next part says, this is an important uh, tool that you need to learn how to use, fsol. Okay, what does fsol do? fsol solves any nonlinear algebraic equation of this form f of x equal to zero. But you need to write how to calculate that f of x, and then fsol will find that value of x which makes that function equal to 0. If you put any arbitrary value of x, the function will not be 0. So your job is to write that function and that function is essentially the same function. Okay? So you will write it in such a way that we will cancel this and you will write left hand side minus right hand side equals a function which is a function only of C2. C2 is your unknown. Okay? So, this is an important step as an engineer because you are formulating the problem in a way that MATLAB can solve it for you. So, you are identifying what is the function. The function is the left hand side minus right hand side <coughs> and you want to make that function equal to 0 for a particular value of C2. So, you make C2 as the input argument. Okay? So, any questions on that? Does everybody understand? Please. Yeah. Doesn't it ask for at least no, some problems may have two unknowns, some problems may have three unknowns. FSOL can handle all of them, but we will see later on when you have two equations in two unknowns, you will still pass both the unknowns as a vector instead of two variables as a vector. Okay? So in this particular problem, there is only one unknown, that is C2. All the others are known. So how would I write this function? I will start by saying function f equals, I have to give it a certain name, I always use this format, A05P1, okay, and the input is C2, 
So I've identified what the function is, I've identified what the input is, I've identified what the output is going to be. Output is going to be the function value itself. The input is going to be the unknown C2 in that function. And everything else is known. So you should have statements like, uh, inside that function, statements like D2 equals 165, etc. All the constants that appear in the function must be written, declared, defined. Okay? And then the last statement in the function would be f equals that exact expression that you see here, b1 square plus c1 square, b1 square plus c1 square minus 2, b1, c1, cos d, a1 minus the right hand side, which is b2 square, b2 square minus C2 square minus 2 B2 C2 cos A2. And I've given you the solution, right? But how does it work? F sol sends in a value, a guest value for C2. And that C2 is used in here and in here. Every other variable in this equation you define, okay? So all these variables, b1, c1, a1, these must be defined in lines before. They are defined internally, in the internal <coughs> local variable. Okay? And that's, that's what you need to do. And to use this with the script file, this is a function file that will be saved in a, a, a a05p1.m. And to use it in the workspace or in a script file. Okay, all you have to do is uh, f solve. You have to give the name of the function, and this you should get used to it because we will solve other problems. The next assignment, there are some of them are coming. First argument to f solve is the function name, and the second one is some guess for the unknown. Okay. And I think in one of the classes previously we have seen how fsol interacts with the function that you have identified to arrive at a solution. But when you enter this, it will solve and it will give you the value of one value of C2. Okay? So fsol finds one solution at a time. Even though there may be many roots, it finds only one root and the root closest to your initial guess. Okay? Any questions on that? Pardon me? This could be any number. It's a guess that you are giving it to F solve and it searches for the root near that value. I'm going to conduct a poll. How many of you find it useful? Not many. How many of you find it boring? You have already figured this out, you didn't expect this. Was that a surprise, meaning that it is this simple? I didn't get it. I want to know whether I am resonating with your learning, okay? If I am talking about something and it doesn't hit you, then we are not succeeding in this class. Is this the kind of help you wanted with the assignment? Is that better? How many of you feel now you can do it? Okay. Shall we move on to the next problem? How many of you need help in the second problem? That's good. Numbers are going down. So maybe many of you have figured that out. So um, so the second problem is one of, this is more close to chemical engineering storage tank problem. Yeah? Sorry, um, for the third problem, is there any way you can upload a clear picture? I I will upload, uh, somebody asked me of numbers, I will upload the numbers into the forum, okay? That's all you need, all the variables in the, uh, in the figure, yeah, okay? So the second problem is about using, learning to use the if condition. The problem is the following, okay? You have a storage tank with a conical part and a cylindrical part with the following dimensions, and this is R, okay? And you are told that you are, 
uh, in fact, that is a good idea. If you guys have solved this problem, you find it boring, <laughs> you're welcome to leave. But if you, and the other extreme is those of you who feel that you need additional help, I'm willing to meet on a Thursday evening or a Friday evening, six to seven, seven to eight, to help, okay? So I want to address the lower end of the class, but at the same time, if you have figured it out, you can leave, but then don't come to my office if you figure it out, okay? Because I don't want to waste the time twice. I cover it here, and then you come back, you miss the class, and you come back and say, I, I want help. That's not fair, okay? So, um, in this problem, the depth of the liquid level could be anything. So there are two inputs, the radius and the depth. So you're going to write a function that will accept these and calculate the volume of the liquid. If the level is somewhere here, what is the total volume of the liquid? Or if the level is here, what is the total volume of the liquid? So you need to know the formula for the cone. And the cone is 1 over 3 pi r cube d, where r is the radius at that particular position, lowercase r. And d is the depth up to that point. So if d happens to be between 0 and r, that is over this distance, you will use only the cone, because the volume is determined by the cone, up to the actual depth. But if D happens to be more than R, but less than 3R, then you have to have two parts to your volume. Okay? So that is the cylinder plus the cone. And what is the volume of the cylinder? It is pi R squared multiplied by the length of the cylinder. But in this case, if the depth is measured from here, what would be that length? d minus r. Okay? So this is the formula, but you have to pick and choose the formula correctly to calculate it. So how would I write this function? I'm not going to show you the function structure, but I'm going to assume that r is coming as a scalar and d is coming as a vector. Okay? So um, input is r and d, and this part you fill it out, what that should be. Okay? And then I'm going to set up a loop for i going from 1 to length of d. Okay? So I'm counting how many values there are in d. And for each value, I need to determine whether the, length, the depth is in the first regime or in the second zone or in the third zone. So this is the, where you will use the if condition. So if d of i is less than r, that means you are somewhere in this regime, anywhere, here, here, or here, less than r, so it's only the cone part is filled, then you will have the statement vi equals one third pi r squared, okay, r squared times d, but what is r? r is the radius at, at that level. But what is that radius? In this particular case, this angle is 45 degrees. Okay, how do you know that? Because you know that the height is r and this radius is r. So it's a 45 degree isosceles triangle if you take this triangle. Okay? So r is equal to d. The radius at any depth is equal to the depth itself. So you can replace this by d squared multiplied by d, or you can replace it by dq, okay? Any questions on that? No? So that is a conditional execution. So only if d, uh, di is less than r, when we are still in the cone region, you use that formula. Else, if, that means, if that is not true, yeah. Uh, you could make it as less than or equal to. Yeah, it won't change anything. Yeah. Okay. Else, if you need to check a condition. Now, let me see whether you can come up with the condition. What condition would I put that needs to be checked? Now, I'm looking in the region where the depth is above this level, but below the top. So, what condition should I put? di greater than r and 
I want it to be greater than R and I want it to be less than 3R, 3 times R. Okay? If that condition is satisfied, then I put the formula for VI, which is 1 over 3 pi. What should I put? D cubed or R cubed because when this comes up to this part, the radius is R. The radius of the cone part is R. Okay? So it is 1 over 3 pi R squared times R. So it is R cubed plus pi R squared D minus R. Please don't just write it down assimilate it, understand it. I think that's important. Okay? You can write it down, you can go and type it, and you can make it work, you can submit it. In an exam, you'll be still stuck. Make sure that you understand it. Yeah? Instead of doing else can you just make multiple if statements? Yes, you can. Yeah, you can. So if the first condition is satisfied, <laughs> you put the V I equal to an N N, right. then if you can do that as well. Yeah. Okay? So else, that means it is not less than R, it's not less than 3R, it's more than 3R. Then you, you are asked to so set that value to infinity. And then you end it. And then you end your for loop. OK? That is the solution to the second problem. OK? Any questions? No? Yeah? We wrote that in an editor, right? In like for a function or just function? This is a function. This is a function that you write in an editor and then save it. Okay. And then to execute it, you have to, let me put uh, a 0, 5, p2 equals v. OK, I guess I didn't want to write it, but function v equals a name and then the input. So this is saved in a file. And then to execute it from the command line, we will just say A05P2, 1, whatever the number is, 0 0.5, 1, 3.21, 3, whatever it is. Okay, or you can declare R equal to 1 and D equal to, and then pass R and D, whichever you want. How many of you have done? Yeah, sorry. I, was, I did something similar to this. That is a strange error. Bring it with to me. Uh, I, was like, I was like really close. I was really close. Right. Yeah. If you have strange errors like that, and if you're not able to decipher it, bring it to me. I will try. I'm not a MATLAB expert. As I said, MATLAB has 10,000 commands, 10,000 functions. Okay. So what I am trying to do in this course is learn enough about it so that we can solve engineering problems and understand how engineering problems and as per are solved. Okay. So the ability to learn by yourself, I think, is important. That's what I'm trying to focus on. Now, <clears throat> any other questions on this problem? How many of you have done the third problem? How many of you need help with the third problem? OK. Um, the third problem, I, I, I'm just going to, again, try to sketch the, what, is, what is the difficulty with the third problem? Can anybody kind of identify? Yeah. Once you set up the equations, you're supposed to arrange them so you can make the matrix of just the variable. Right. That's exactly what it is. So instead of talking about directly the third problem, I'll make up a problem and show you. Okay. So I have an equation like 10x1 plus 5x2 plus 3 x3 three plus x4 <coughs> minus 5 equal to 0. Okay? So I have a 4 by 4 system. I'm just going to make it up. Okay? 2 x1 plus x3 plus x4, 2 x4 minus 2 equal to 0. Third equation is x2 plus 4 x4 
equal to zero. The fourth equation is x five x one plus x four plus x three equal to zero. So you, when you write the mass balance equation for each one of the reactors, and I've given you one template, you just you have to use that. How many of you have difficulty in that? Can you all write those five equations using 2171? Anybody needing help in that? Okay, so the question then is, after having written those five equations, how do I put them in the form AX equal to B? If you can do that, that means you must define what the matrix A is, what the vector B is, in MATLAB, the solution is simply x equals a backslash b. Okay, so by in, so in order to do that, you must define what all the coefficients in the matrix A are and what the elements in B are. Then a backslash b will give you, using Gaussian elimination, all the solution vector. Okay, so our task is to take this set of equations and construct the matrix A and B. Okay, so how do I do that? I do that in two steps. First one, I figure out on a piece of paper where all the elements go. So the unknowns are going to be x1, x2, x3, x4. There are four unknowns, four equations. In your case, there are five unknowns, five equations. Okay? And I need to figure out what all these elements are going to be. So I just use the rule of matrix multiplication. So if I have, for example, these four spots, Okay, the matrix multiplication says this multiplied by x1 plus the second multiplied by x2 plus the third multiplied by x3 plus the fourth multiplied by x4 must equal what is on the right hand side. So I must populate this matrix with the correct information so that I get the first equation. Okay, so please help me. What is the coefficient that multiplies x1 in the first equation? 10. So if I had put 10 there, I will get 10 times x1. Plus, what is the coefficient that multiplies x2? 5. What is the coefficient that multiplies x3? 3. And then, 1. Do you understand? So that's how I populate and I figure out what these elements are going to be. And what will be on the right hand side? 5. Because this goes to the right hand side. Okay? And you do that for this, uh, let's take for the second equation. So this is going to be 2, 0, because there is no x2, 0, and then 1, 2. And what will be on the right hand side? 2. Okay? Any questions on that? Anybody has any question on that? And what will be the third one? 0, 1, 0, 4 equals 0. Does everybody understand that? Okay. What would be the last one? Zero. That is a very important step. Whenever you have a system of linear equations, it is your job to construct that matrix. Okay. In your current assignment, these are not just nice numbers like 10 or 5, but they are given in terms of Q10, the flow rate, and C10, the concentration. But those numbers are given, so you can calculate that. Okay? So that's it. And once you have different, now, how do you write a script file? At this stage, after you figure it out, you actually have statements like this A11 equals 10, A12 equals 5, A13 equals 3, A14 equals 1, B1 equals 5, and you repeat this, okay? And that after you define all the A's and the B's, then you, the last statement would be this, and that will give you the solution. With this one, how many of you feel comfortable that you can do the last problem? Half the hands. How many of you still feel that you cannot do the last problem? This is not a complete set. <laughs> uh, all right. Any any questions on that? Yeah. The, the, see, this is in a piece of paper you have figured out what the matrix A is, but in a script file, 
you need to define what A1, A11 is. Okay, so you have to write a script file containing these statements that will put the right numbers in the right elements of the matrix inside matrix. Yeah? You could write it as like 10, 5, 10. Yes, yes, you could do this. For example, this is where the power of subscript manipulation, you could, for example, say A1, uh, colon. That means in the first row, you're going to put all the numbers. So you can then open this up and say 10, 5, 3, 1. That's fine. Or you could just say A equals 10, 5, 3, 1, semicolon, 2, 0, 1, 2, semicolon. You can do that as well. Yeah, you can do that as well. Exactly. That's the last statement. Yeah. So for the solutions, you want um, the diary file with the script along in a zip file, or do you just want just diary? Uh, diary or the report. I showed you how to generate the report. I mean, do you also do you want uh, the script and the or the function file in the zip? Yeah, I want the script file and the function file and the results. Okay, in a zip. However, with the you capture, yeah, in okay. a diary or in a report, whichever. All right. When you first posted this, um, I went and printed it out, and then based on that. The yeah, I had an error there. I had an error. So okay. the correct answer is 171. So when I went and I've already submitted, and I, ha I was using the 115. That's if you calculate, you don't put that in. Right, yeah, but for, like for the F solve and stuff, like when you have to put in a guess, 